Well, welcome everyone. We have to get started because my grandson tells me that it's seven o'clock and we have to get done in time so that they can go to bed early enough. <laughs> well, thanks very much for coming and it's uh, uh, my uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Bruce Lennox, who's the Dean of Science, uh, to introduce you to what's going to happen here tonight. So, Professor Lennox. Thank you, Joe. Um, it's really uh, great to be here this evening for this really important celebration. So, a warm, warm McGill welcome to all of you. Uh, I recognize many of you, but uh, I know that uh, the following that the OSS and uh, the, the team that Joe uh, leads, uh, has it's reached far beyond the, the McGill borders, so it's great to see you all. Probably more than anyone else uh, here, maybe except for Joe, uh, I saw the, the genesis of the OSS when I came here 37 years ago. Uh, as a new assistant professor in the Department of Chemistry. And what I saw was, in the last 25 years, the emergence of something that's really quite remarkable. 25 years ago, our colleague David Harp, Professor David Harp, uh, uh, renowned organic chemist and uh, co-instructor with Joe and his colleague uh, Ariel Fenster of the World of Chemistry courses, uh, presented the vision to the Department of Chemistry and to the university that there should be an organization at McGill that actually formally brings the discussion of contemporary issues in, in science, uh, very often chemistry, because chemistry is the central science. Uh, <laughs> but a discussion that actually brings the facts, the reality of science, and the controversies in a framed, very, very fair, thorough, and I would say unbiased point of view. This was, they, they knew that this was necessary 35 years ago and 25 years ago, but then it became incorporated literally uh, under the leadership of Principal Bernard Shapiro and my predecessor as Dean of Science, two, two times removed, Alan Shaver. In 1999, uh, the three of them, uh, Dave, Joe, Ariel, and the two leadership people put together the, this organization called the Office for the Science for Chemistry and Society. So that was a great start. Uh, it, it morphed fairly quickly into something that was f f more far-reaching. Uh, I didn't think it was actually necessary, but uh, uh, and to be Office for Science and Society. But it was fairer, too, because uh, what was becoming very, very uh, obvious at that time that there was so much junk out there in terms of the representation in science. But that junk was showing up not in the manner that we see it now, but it was actually in the print media. So fast forward to 2011 when philanthropist extraordinaire Lauren Trotje stepped forward with an extraordinary endowment to support the OSS and its vision of promoting evidence-based science. It's not often that one can use the word extraordinary twice in one sentence, but when you're speaking about Mr. Trotje, it's very appropriate. Since its inception 25 years ago, the OSS has had a remarkable track re record of demystifying science using traditional media, radio, television, newspapers, that's where they, they started. But they were probably the earliest adopter that I knew of, of really understanding how the internet was disseminating information, uh, how social media was then piggybacking on that. And today they're reaching 50,000 people each week uh, through their, their different channels, really remarkable number. So the work continues for the OSS because the challenges presented by separating fact from fiction in the scientific space are not decreasing with the work of the OSS, but they're ever increasing. And the pandemic just showed us just how vulnerable we are all to junk descriptions, junk science, junk interpretations. 
And let me tell you, um, as a dean of science, I'm on the receiving end of many, many lawyers' letters <laughs> that start with cease and desist about something that they had written the week before. Uh, I open these up, some trepidation, because I'm usually also involved in the impending lawsuit. Uh, but then by the time I finish the letter, all I can say is, good job, Joe, good job, OSS, uh, because these people are defending uh, nonsense. Uh, I don't think I've ever sec received a second lawyer letter over the same issue. <laughs> Let me just finish these welcome comments with sort of a, a personal observation. Um, I've asked myself, since I first came to McGill, when they were doing these incredible world of chemistry courses and these incredible evening public lectures that attracted thousands, 300,000 people one summer at the old port to see chemistry. I mean, it's, it's spectacular. But I ask, well, why, why, why isn't this franchised? Why isn't this everywhere? Why is, why is it just happening here? And I've asked myself that and I come to the same conclusion each time, that when you're doing something that's really big, really impactful, and sustainable, you have to start with the right people. And the OSS has David Harp, Ariel Fenster, and Joe Schwartz, the right people. Three scientists with exceptional knowledge, but also exceptional communication and teaching skills because communication, however we look at it, even if we're advertisers, it's education. But realizing the vision that they had also took courage, the courage to challenge these people day after day, week after week. That's not something that everyone can bring to the table over 25 or 35 years, but they did and have. Then add in a courageous philanthropist, Mr. Trottier, who brought the support that was necessary to make sure that this could be happening with the staff that is needed. This isn't a one-person one show, uh, you need, and you need to train people. And then position all of this in a world-class university. Uh, a university, of course, exists to create knowledge and the truth that knowledge can lead to. But institutions, I don't think it's really properly regarded. Institutions can also be courageous. And I think that we're incredibly fortunate that we're in a courageous institution. McGill supported these people whose mission was to debunk myths and nonsense. Lawyers, threats, be damned. Just go ahead and do what was right. So every time I ask this question, why is the OSS unique and why is it at McGill? I come to the same conclusion. McGill provides a unique, unique combination of hosting courageous founders, a courageous supporter in Mr. Trotje, and above all, a courageous institutional home for the OSS. Thank you, Joe. Since the beginning of times, there have been myths folk tales and false information all around that have clouded people's ability to make sound decisions. One would think that in our modern, advanced technological world, these would be things of the past. In the last 25 years, the Office for Science and Society has had to face off against an ever-increasing volume of BS and bunkum as the internet has empowered every half-baked idea and every tinfoil hat-wearing crackpot. Once upon a time, these folks were cranking out their ideas on a Gestetner machine. Today, they can reach millions, and with the advent of AI-generated content, the future looks like there will be even more battles to fight. Misinformation, falsehoods, and charlatans are more prevalent than ever. Ask an astronaut about flat earthers. The team of Harp, Schwartz, and Schuster have had an enormously important impact through bringing an understanding of scientific discoveries to the public in helping us all understand the truth of developments across areas based on science. Given the rise in anti-science beliefs that threaten human well-being, like climate change and vaccine denial, 
the mission of the OSS is more important than ever. This is why the work of Dr. Joe and the brilliant team at the McGill Office for Science and Society has been so important. You guys have always been uh, on the cutting edge, at the forefront, ahead of the curve when it comes to public engagement and science communication. I am confident that the OSS will have an even greater role as we move through the disruptive phase of AI and its potential for great good and great harm. As a lifelong science geek, I've always been a strong supporter of its mission to separate sense from nonsense. So we'll need the Office for Science and Society more than ever. The odds are against them. Your work has always been valuable, but it's never been as important as it is today. Now, when misinformation and disinformation is more abundant than ever, I can tell you that you have been a leading light for the last quarter of a century in, in trying to explain science simply and frankly in a way that's fun. We happen to be in the same business, so you know as well as I do, it's re rewarding and it can be frustrating, just like something else we share. And hopefully it won't be 25 more years until this works out. I've worked with Joe for many years, and despite the fact that Joe is a Yankees fan and a Golden State Warriors fan and a Canadiens fan, and I don't really know his NFL team, I always just assumed it was the Patriots. Despite all of that, I love Joe. I think Joe is charming and smart and funny and a great guy, and he makes science not only understandable, but a joy to listen to. Translating science can often be difficult. The language can be perplexing, but it's been done. And more importantly, to remove the nonsense that often appears uh, in, the, in the social media about science. Thank you for the content you put out there. When there are things I need to know, often I search your site, and there it is. You guys put out a tremendous body of work, and I appreciate all that you do. It's a great service that you're providing. I started working at the McGill OSS when I was an undergrad and continued subsequently uh, before I went to medical school. OSS taught me one of the most important lessons in science, which is critical thinking, and it helped shape me into who I am today as a doctor and scientist. Since near its beginning, Dr. Joe has been responsible for organizing the annual Trotsier Public Science Symposium at McGill. A wide range of topics are covered. I'm standing beside the commemorative plaques that the OSS gave me. And yes, there is room for more to answer Joe's question. An interesting truth of thing is as I'm talking on my screen, I just got an email from Joe Schwartz. I read his cup of Joe every day. The OSS and Dr. Joe have become fixtures of logic, clarity, and honesty. But we should all be grateful for them taking the battle on on behalf of all of us. This mission is essential and must continue. I want to take this opportunity to express my sincere congratulations. For 25 years of debunking myth, informing and educating us. Thank you. Thank you for being a touchstone during these difficult times. Thank you, OSS, and happy 25th. 25 years. I appreciate all that you do. Congratulations to Dr. Joe. Congratulations to you in the group. Bravo and felicitations. A huge congratulations. Congratulations on 25 years. 25 years of amazing work. With my very best wishes. Happy 25th anniversary, OSS. And hope for another 25 years. Mazel tov. Congratulations again. Upward and onward for the next 25 years. Congrats to all of my friends at McGill's OSS. And as always, go science. <laughs>
to miracle arthritis cures, to sort of simple, why is spandex practically a scientific miracle? Um, Joe was kind of my skeptic go-to guy when I wonder if something like auto urine therapy or sp space farmed kimchi or double helix water consumption is going to help me live to 150. And I think both Joe and the whole science and society office working with him, I've just been great at really at exposing charlatans and quacks and other hacks, as well as just improving my own scientific literacy. And for that alone, I thank him, you know? And, I, and on top of this, Joe is just like a slice of Montreal. He's in print, he's in radio, he's on TV. He's actually live. It's an amazing thing. <laughs> and, uh, and McGill is a slice of Montreal. And I think that's an important thing for all of us to defend too here these days. So. Uh, Josh, you know, talk, <laughs> talking about being live, because for the past, past few years, we've been doing a lot of online teaching, a lot of students. And sometimes I walk on the campus and a student will come up and be startled and say that you actually exist, you know? <laughs> well, I mean, there, there is a rumor you're, there's a fake Joe out there now, so be careful if you see a fake Joe selling crystals, okay? <laughs> By the way, Joe's going to offer us some cool science demonstrations along the way and some magic tricks too. So let's just get it going. Why don't we just start fast? Show us, explain to us what the OS is, what the OSS is, why did it start, what does it do, and what does it do, apart from sounding like a secret service organization, because it sounds like a spy agency, the OSS. Well, maybe you should ask. <laughs> I'm just ready to do that. Okay. And I'll tell you something else, interesting sort of in, inside story about the OSS, which was actually an American uh, enterprise during the Second World War, it's the Secret Service. And a few weeks ago, uh, we were on a cruise and on the world's largest ship, the icon of the seas, which is really something. And anyway, the, the ship all of a sudden stops in the middle of the ocean because there was, there was a boat of refugees. They were trying to go from Cuba to the US and they got lost. So the ship sends out a patrol boat to see what it is, maybe pirates, you know, didn't know, but eventually picked them up. And I had my OSS hat on. <laughs> and a guy comes up to me, this is an absolutely true story. And walking there, a guy comes up to me and says, are you here because of them? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what he thought. Oh, I had been parachuted on there. <laughs> anyway, okay, let's get started. Beginning, let's go back. Well, maybe not quite that far. <laughs> we'll go back to when uh, I was, I think, seven years old. And I read Jules Verne. He was my first hero. And these were the first two books. Of course, they were in Hungarian. Uh, you won't recognize them like that, but you recognize them like this. And that introduced me to science. Got interested in it, learned how to do some interesting experiments, had chemistry sets when I was young, learned how to go up to St. Joseph's Oratory with a couple of friends and put silver nitrate into the holy water, <laughs> <laughs> which I can tell you is pretty neat. Silver nitrate is light sensitive. It turns dark on exposure to light. And as you may know, the pilgrims come, they dip their finger in and cross themselves on the forehead. <laughs> they come out, the sun exposes them, and they have these indelible black crosses on their forehead. <laughs> they thought they had seen a miracle, <laughs> and they had. <laughs> it was a chemical miracle. I mean, isn't that a miracle? That you have a colorless silver nitrate solution and it changed into deposit of metallic silver upon exposure to light, which of course is the essence of photography. But where I really got started was in Professor Dave Harp's class. Uh, I was in his first class he ever taught. And he was the first teacher that I really had who made connections to everyday life. And I got interested in organic chemistry. Uh, and I started talking about organic chemistry. And uh, I'm still talking about the same molecules in <laughs> organic chemistry. Anyway, he, he got me started, and I got into talking to the public about all kinds of interesting chemical uh, phenomena. And then in 1975, uh, with uh, Ariel Fenster, we started the Magic of Chemistry show. 
uh, w where we had demonstrations and some magic tricks. And then in 1980, uh, we were asked to put on uh, sort of a, a science display, like a mini uh, science museum uh, at the uh, UNESCO Pavilion. And uh, some of you may recognize that because during Expo 67, that was the Bell Telephone Pavilion. It was taken over by UNESCO and they wanted something scientific. And uh, they asked Professor Harp if you know, he could do something and he asked us and, and we got together. And we organized demonstrations and uh, the public came to see the usual puffs and bangs and explosions and they gathered around and uh, as you heard we put through about 300,000 people that one summer including some rather interesting guests. Uh, you will recognize the uh, gentleman in the back row that was Mayor Drapeau uh, who of course became famous for saying that uh, uh, Expo or the, the Olympics could lose no money. Uh, it was more likely for a man to get pregnant than for uh, to lose money. And sitting beside him, of course, was uh, then Prime Minister Trudeau. And in front was Justin. And you'll recognize him. Uh, he, of course, is famous in my eyes only for one reason. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, Dave and Ariel and I got together. We got to travel across Canada, across the US doing the, the magic show. We had a lot of great experiences. Uh, one of the uh, most memorable ones was at the uh, Canadian Embassy in Washington. Uh, and that was really a highlight. And then in 1995 uh, at Expotech, which now is the, the Science uh, Museum, uh, which was uh, run for a while by, by Julie uh, Payette. Uh, they wanted a chemistry display as well. And we put it together and got a lot of advertisement, even on, on buses. And once again, you know, we hired students and they would do the puffs and the bangs. And that's when, as you, you heard, uh, Professor uh, Bernard Shapiro, who was uh, the principal of McGill at that time, opened the office in a spectacular fashion and uh, at first it was the office for chemistry and society and we started to give large talks to, to the public and over the years we did about 70 of these evening presentations as you can see to some 13,000 people uh, we uh, organized um, high school groups to come into McGill to uh, experience chemistry and then uh, we started to, to deal with more topics, so it became the Office for Science and Society, and our popularity multiplied. And we were able to give talks all over the place, and, uh, but really one of the most, uh, I, I think, satisfying aspects of everything that we have done was the courses that we give here at McGill uh, to undergraduates, no matter what faculty they are in. And uh, we put through a lot of students, uh, 61,000 or so over the years. <laughs> some of you are here. <laughs> yeah. And some of your children are in our classes now. And we're almost at a point where some of your grandchildren can be in, in our classes, al almost. Anyway, of course, we also got into the, the quack-busting game uh, because there was so much nonsense that was uh, around. And uh, that uh, triggered my hobby, which some would say is an obsession of collecting ducks. But I do because I want to be surrounded by them because they serve as a constant reminder of how vigilant we have to be, how much nonsense and misinformation there is out there. But also what is satisfying is over the years we trained a number of interns that we've had. My very first one was Guy Remorovsky, who then went on to become quite a noted uh, producer at NOVA. And then uh, we had Melody uh, and uh, we trained her to do demonstrations, trained her to do magic. Uh, but now as you saw in the video, she does a different kind of, uh, of magic. Uh, but uh, it is really satisfying to see your students grow up and establish themselves. Ada McVean, much more recently, is right now in, in England, and she writes both for Skeptical Enquirer and for uh, Chemistry World and for other publications as well. And then in 2011, Laurent Chartier 
uh, gave us the, the grant which made uh, our finances uh, much better <laughs> and we were able to do a lot and we started uh, to, we took over the Chartier Symposium and uh, Emily Shore joined us and Emily basically runs she runs our lives and uh, organizes everything in an absolutely spectacular fashion. The, uh, <laughs> the very first year, uh, James Randi uh, was our speaker. It, he filled this room even more than what we, we have now. And uh, since that time, we've had a number of symposia uh, with really well-known people. We had Dr. Walter Willett from Harvard, Jane Brody from the New York Times, Paul Offit, of course, told us about vaccines, Jill Tarter about extraterrestrial life. And then we had Patch Adams, Dr. Patch Adams, who entertained us in an interesting fashion. And one of my favorites was Ruth Westheimer. We had, <laughs> yeah, some of you remember her. Yeah, she, that was quite something. And in conjunction with the symposia, we also have round table discussions, which are recorded. And then Jonathan Jerry joined us. Uh, Jonathan is a, a, an outstanding writer and science communicator. He can do it both in English and in, in French. And uh, and we keep having just absolutely excellent interns. And uh, we have some now, they are here with us today. And I know, I know you're saying they're all girls, they're all girls. We try to have guys, really. But somehow the girls are more conscientious. They produce more, uh, you know. We've had guys and they will work for a while and then they just go off. Anyway, uh, some other people to, to, to thank. Bernard Shapiro, of course, who was the, the principal when we, we started. Uh, Alan Shaver, who was the dean. And then uh, uh, Dean Martin Grant took over. And of course, uh, uh, Dr. Lennox, who has been absolutely supportive. So that's sort of the background to the uh, OSS. Now we have some idea of what it is that we do. Now we can discuss the rest. Okay, so it is a Secret Service organization, I understand now. <laughs> Look, you know, to start with, there seem to be armies of false experts out there. Now, false experts selling miracle diets, mi magic crystals, levitation meditation, live forever superfoods. I mean, why are these quacks, as you correctly term them, so successful? Are, is it their skill or is it our need? Uh, it's both. They, they generally promise simple solutions to complex problems. And uh, that's what people want. You know, uh, whenever there's any kind of a health issue, you will start thinking, what is it? What, what did I do wrong? And what can I do right to remedy it? And unfortunately, we in the scientific world don't always have an answer to that. But the quacks do. And they will rush in to, f to fill the void the vacuum that science leaves. And they're very good at that. And you know, I, I've always said that we have to give them begrudging credit because they, they are compelling. They, they have learned to cloak themselves in the garb of science. They have learned to spout pseudoscientific lingo that to the uninitiated sounds reputable. And so they, they do fill this need. People want solutions to their problems. You know that uh, years ago I made a documentary film about phony experts, and I visited an expert training school in the States, um, where the first rule they taught, and I always remember it, they taught, they had 25 budding experts, I think I told you at the time, they were all would-be experts, and the rule they taught them, rule number one was always sound certain, never sound uncertain, never say maybe, never say sometimes, always say always. How does right. that compare with the world you live in? I, I totally recognize that. And the world that we live in, the scientific world, our language has to be peppered with ifs and buts and maybes. And just about every scientific paper ends with more studies are needed. Okay? Uh, whereas the alternative practitioners have an answer to everything. 
and it's always the same. There's no more research that is needed because everything is, is known. When you look at something like homeopathy, which to me is the most absurd of all of the alternative practices out there, because non-existent molecules do not cure existing diseases. Uh, it has been the same for 200 years. It hasn't evolved. They say exactly the same thing as they were saying 200 years ago when science was you know, in a fledgling state. Whereas in the real world of science, things change. We evolve and we correct when mistakes are made. Science is self-correcting. You know, and sometimes I'll, I'll have students come up to me uh, or you know, even in public talks, someone will come up to me and say, you know, I was in your class X years ago uh, and I remember you saying that, that vitamin E is good to, to take and now you're saying it's unnecessary. You see you guys, you scientists, one day you say this, next day you say that. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, first of all, I would say that you know, an interval of 30, 40 years is not exactly one day this, next day that. <laughs> but the fact is that in 30 years, science evolves a great deal. And indeed, 30 years ago, there was some evidence for vitamin E being preventative for heart disease. But numerous randomized, double-blind studies have been done since that time. And that, of course, is the gold standard in science, the randomized controlled double-blind trial, which has shown that no, it in fact uh, doesn't work like that. So we change. And, you know, I mean, this is one of the nice things about being able to change, uh, to, to, to teach the courses we teach, you know, in food and, and drugs, is that it forces you to keep up with, with what is happening because it's happening day by day. Okay, so I'm going home, I'm throwing out my vitamin E. <laughs> what is it I should be using instead? <laughs> Good question. And uh, that's a question, of course, that comes up all the time with, with supplements because those are so heavily promoted. But there's so many problems with that. The first problem is that you don't even know, or you can't be guaranteed that what it says on the bottle is really what is in there because nobody checks. I mean, this is just a terrible thing in Canada with the uh, uh, Office of Natural Health Products. Uh, it's enough to show that something is safe. You do not have to show that it's effective. And you can, as a dietary supplement, you can sell almost uh, anything. So that's one problem that you, you may not even be getting what you think that you're getting. And the other is that there is a distinct lack of evidence for all of those supplements. And if someone really does need a supplement, those are not the people who are buying them. The people who are buying the supplements are the ones who can afford them and who generally have a good diet anyway. You know, the, the, the poor people who have an atrocious diet are not the ones who can fork out the money for, uh, and the only supplement that actually would make sense would be a multivitamin mineral supplement. It's, if you have a terrible diet, it's possible to be deficient, but it's, it's unlikely. What do you take in the morning? Uh, I have my blueberries. I have my raspberries. I slice in some banana. I put some flaxseed on top. I put some chia seed on top. I put a dollop of yogurt on top of that. I have my avocado toast. And I have a coffee. <laughs> That's that is my breakfast. <laughs> That's unreal. But I, you know, I, don't, I don't say never about anything. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a, a croissant, but only if it comes from uh, La Meunerie on the... Uh... <laughs> Ooh, shop there yesterday. I know you got a lot of questions. I'm sure people have them. About the, over the years, how have questions from the public changed? Have they changed? One. And they if have, so, how have they changed? Yes, they, they've changed. I, I would say that, you know, when we first started, Many of the questions were about how something works. How do you clean your bathtub? I mean, I, I had that question ad nauseum, right? Um, if it's not the bathtub, then it's the toilet. Or, uh, and then, you know, you had questions uh, uh, about uh, uh, cooking. You know, why, uh, why is it that uh, when you cook cabbage, it changes color? You know, we had these kind of things. Or what is lipstick made up of? Uh, 
But over the years, uh, it has changed in, in, in the sense that many of the questions start with, is it true that? The answer is almost always no. <laughs> or is such and such a thing toxic? Is something dangerous? Uh, today, there's tremendous concern about unnamed toxins out there and detox regimens. Everything from coffee enemas to, to pills that you would, you, you would take you know, to regurgitate the contents of your, of your stomach. So yeah, it has changed in, in that sense that, that it, uh, people are far more worried about things. And that I attribute to the internet. I mean, aren't we healthier than we've ever been? I mean, they worry more. Is there more to worry about or less to worry about? Well, there's more to worry about, uh, thanks to my colleagues, the analytical chemists, because they are now so good at finding things, not only down to parts per billion, but parts per trillion. You know what a part per trillion is? It's homeopathy. <laughs> <laughs> homeopathy is, is not even a part per trillion. <laughs> I don't even know what number would uh, designate the non-existent molecules in there. But a part per trillion is the width of a credit card compared to the distance between the Earth and the Moon. Now, yeah, think about that for a moment. That can be detected. In fact, smaller than that can be detected. I don't know, Bruce, what are we down to now? Uh, uh, Pento. Pento, yeah, I mean, uh, unimaginable that this, this can be detected. So eventually we find that everything is contaminated by everything else, right? And then, of course, you start to worry because people don't ask the right question. Science uses numbers as its currency. So the question always to ask, how much? How does it compare to what we know? It doesn't do any good to know that there's X parts per million of some contaminant in your food if you don't know what has been deemed to be the acceptable daily intake and how it compares to that. So uh, numbers are, are critical. And you know, often you know, the answers are not white or black. It's science is various shades of gray, and that's you know, one of, one of the, the problems. But certainly many of the questions that come up today are about worries. Yeah, I think you said to me before, just before this started, that the question you, maybe you get the most is about water. Is my well, water, yes. I, like I, I've always believed the lead in my water is good for me. But you're probably <laughs> gonna say it's not, right? Yeah, well, I think we can categorically say that lead in your water is not good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, we're safe uh, to say that. And lead is uh, unfortunately one of those contaminants which, which is toxic at very low levels. So it is important to know whether you have it in your water or not, but the only way you can know that is to test it. And if there is, then uh, that uh, something does need to be done, especially if there are children and infants in, in the crowd. For most of us, it doesn't matter, <laughs> right? We've, uh, whatever Let has done is, is already done. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, Let is, yeah. and th then the question is, how do you get rid of it? Well, there, there are special filters. In your Brita, you can put a, a Let filter. You can have an under the sink filter. It's a relatively easy problem to, to deal with. Listen, I know you uh, do a lot of uh, scientific demonstrations to educate and entertain the peop and people. What have you got for us tonight? Uh, All right. I, well, haven't, I haven't seen these, so I'm yeah, curious too. Yeah, demos. Uh, you know, they, they say a picture is worth a thousand words, but, uh, and a video is, is worth, uh, you know, a thousand pictures, and a live demo is worth a thousand videos. Uh, especially these days, because when you're watching a picture or a video, you don't know what to trust, right? Uh, you can concoct anything. All right, let's see what we can concoct here. Uh, this indeed is one of my favorite uh, demos. And it starts with three solutions that we're going to mix together. Now you see a gold color. I'm gonna take out the gold and replace it with blue. <laughs> but let me see if I can remove that blue. and put it back. First the gold, then the blue. 
Now look, I can even do it through the glass. Watch this. <laughs> now put it back, the gold and the blue. <laughs> you, know, you know what's, several things amazing about this. I mean, I've done this a few times in my life. But every time I do this and I hold it, I'm amazed. And, but you know what I'm amazed at? Is that it looks like, and I even believe that I'm actually doing it. <laughs> you know. But uh, I mean, obviously this is a, a, a classic reaction. It's known as the clock reaction. And it, it's actually quite complicated, but the, the blue color is the reaction between starch and iodine. The yellow color is iodine. It reacts with starch and changes to, to blue. Uh, but it's an amazing reaction. How anyone ever came up with that, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but how did you do it? We all want to know how you did it. Pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I tell you, sometimes you know, I'm, I'm convinced that I'm really pulling it out. <laughs> Uh, so that's one that I've always liked. And uh, the other one that I've done maybe more often than anything else, uh, I used to be a fan of Barbara Eden on I, I Dream of Jeannie, right? You remember that uh, TV show? And you remember how it started? Uh, with uh, Larry Hagman, who played uh, her, I don't know what, he, he found the bottle on, the, on a beach and the genie comes out of the bottle. And I always wondered how they did that in the show, because you actually see the, you know, the smoke coming out of the bottle. And it was only when I was in, uh, in chemistry as an undergraduate that I learned about the genie reaction. We are supposed to put on safety glasses whenever <laughs> do this. So let me show you the genie reaction. This is hydrogen peroxide, the same stuff that you use on your hair. <laughs> and manganese dioxide. And we wait. It's an exothermic reaction, which produces a lot of heat, heats up the water part of the hydrogen peroxide, and out comes the genie. Come on out of there. And I tell you another interesting part of this story. I, I was doing a demonstration once in Vancouver at some science show. Uh, it was actually the, for TV networks. And uh, I was doing this for the Discovery Channel. And next to us was the arts and entertainment booth, who had just purchased the rights to the old I Dream of Genie TV show. Who should be there promoing it? Barbara Eden. <laughs> Looking still pretty good. <laughs> so it was time to venture over there. And I did. And I struck up a conversation. And I asked her, do you know how you came out of the bottle? <laughs> and at first, she had no idea what I was talking about. <laughs> and then I did it for her. And she was totally amazed because she had never seen it. Of course, you know, when they filmed that part, she, she wasn't in it. But she must have seen this a hundred times, you know, on, on the show. So I taught Barbara Eden some chemistry. <laughs> She's still around. Yeah. You would be a dangerous quack, I want to tell you that. Uh, just shift topics. Look, we all lived through COVID. It was a hellish time for all of us. How much worse did pseudoscience make COVID? How much did it cost us? And a how? lot. I mean, uh, it brought out all the quacks, uh, mostly the anti-vaxxers. And uh, with, with their absolute nonsense of, you know, saying, well, you know, how can an mRNA vaccine be safe? How can they have come out with it in a year? Whereas other, you know, it takes decades to come out with a vaccine. And it, it just, that was just a, a question of scientific illiteracy. The mRNA vaccines had been in the works for more than 20 years, since the early 2020s. 
or, or the early 2000s. It, it was about 20 years you know, that they were already working on, on mRNA vaccines for all kinds of things. And then COVID came along, so of course the focus shifted to that. But uh, the technology was not invented for COVID. You know, it, it, it was around. And one of the big problems uh, with the misinformation there, again, gets back to numbers. You know, they dig up these uh, uh, studies where they show that, that there, there's an incidence of cardiomyopathy in people who got the vaccine without ever referring to what is the incidence of cardiomyopathy in the general population. It happens to be the same. You don't have an increase because of the vaccine. And of course, uh, it is also true that no matter what kind of intervention you have, vaccine or surgery or anything else, there's always the chance of some complication. And you know, people have to understand that, that life is all about weighing your risks and benefits. That's, that's what we do. And the benefit of vaccination outweighs the risks by so much you know, that it, it, it's hard to talk about it scientifically. It's, it's just a non-issue. And yet, of course, it has been made into an issue. Well, we got distracted by a lot of phony people selling us phony vaccines, selling us phony fears. Did that prevent some people from getting, paying attention to real treatments? I guess that's what I worry Absolutely. about, the noise. Absolutely, it prevents people. And we've seen this over the years with, with a number of the quack remedies, is that people will go down that route uh, when there are legitimate treatments available. Now, I, I, think, I don't think anyone uh, would, would um, decry uh, someone going some alternative route when everything else has been explored. I think that's, that's very understandable. Desperation drives people to do desperate things. And if someone has some terrible disease, you know, one of the inoperable cancers, uh, of course they will go on web and you know they start reading about apricot pits and you know laetrile and and Mexican clinics you know where, where they make you drink juice morning day, day and night. Uh, as long as they are sure that everything else has been explored, that's understandable. But we've seen often where they will go that route first because they have been convinced by the alternate practitioners that, that you know, medicine doesn't really work uh, and that they have all of the answers. And there are tragic stories. And unfortunately, you know, over the 40 years or so that we've been doing all of this, uh, we've seen a number of those. The internet, we, even referencing the fact that it's bad for the quackery or good for the quackery business, how is it good? What does it do? How has it changed things? Oh, I mean, the internet is the ultimate double-edged sword, right? It can be wonderful. I mean, I haven't been to the library in years. <laughs> why, why should I go to the library? A few keystrokes and it comes to me, right? And if you know how to use it properly, it's fantastic. Uh, I mean, everything is at your fingertips. But there's also the TikTok videos you know, with all of the ridiculous things and, and you know, telling you that, that uh, you know, you, you can cure whatever disease you may have by drinking celery juice. And, you know, this, this is the, the um, basically the, the, the idea of Anthony William, who calls himself the medical medium. He has no scientific education, nothing. He has a very big radio following in, in, in Florida. He's all over the internet. He's written New York Times bestsellers. How does he justify things? He communicates with a spirit, a spirit doctor. And this is how he gets away from not uh, being uh, uh, told that he's practicing medicine without a license, because he's not. He's taking the advice from the spirit doctor and believe me, believe it or not, he gets away with this. And no matter what the ailment, the spirit doctor's answer is celery juice. <laughs> and this is, this is why you may remember, uh, two summers ago, the price of celery skyrocketed. <laughs> it was $6 for a bunch of celery, you remember that? 
that was all because of Anthony William and the, the celery juice. I mean, the, the, the quackery is, is, is just am, uh, amazing. I, I actually have something I can show you here. Uh, it's always interesting what, you know, what they come up with. This, for example, is a device that diagnoses disease. <laughs> and you, you have to hold it in front of a person, and when it starts moving, and starts pointing to an area, <laughs> then you know there's a problem, but there's also a solution that comes with it. It is the pendulum. You have to swing it over the area. You already feel better, right? <laughs> if you don't like that one, someone sent me this. It wards off all toxins. What do you do? You put it in your underwear. <laughs> I don't know why I should be worried about toxins there particularly, but anyway, you know what it is? It's a dried potato. <laughs> I don't know how they come up with, with, do, with this. Do, do, French, do French fried work? <laughs> I, I haven't tried, but, uh, and, well, I've not tried this one either, so, but, but this one, is also really interesting. This is a cure for everything. This is the alpha spin. It looks like a glass coaster. I think it is. <laughs> Someone has drilled a hole in the middle. What do you do with it? And you sit there. And it, you can also put it over your food or over your water, and it will detox it. Does it work as a cure for baldness? <laughs> I'll lend it to you. And <laughs> the, that, of course, is one of the questions that comes up extremely often, is whether or not there's any cure for baldness. And, uh, and look know. at the result. Yeah. Look at the man beside me. He, you know, Hippocrates thought that pigeon droppings were the cure for baldness, but mercifully, you didn't have to eat them. You'd have to rub them on your head. But if you've ever seen a picture of Hippocrates, uh, you know that it didn't work. But this is my all-time favorite. This comes from a guy called Doc Detox. Uh, he's got a big website, and uh, he's all over, sells all kinds of health products. Anyone want to take a guess how you use this and what this is? <laughs> it looks very uncomfortable. <laughs> no, it's that, that's not where it goes, although if, <laughs> if he were here now, that's where it would go. <laughs> this, believe it or not, is a belly button massager. Because that's how you cure disease, with belly button massagers. So I have to throw up my celery juice. I have to get rid of my belly button massager. Do you have anything at all you recommend? Well, I, I tell Any you magic something. Magic bullet, magic yeah. bullet. Yeah. I'm even a bit hesitant to say this. Um, Dr. Linus Pauling was my hero when I was growing up. Probably the greatest chemist of the last century. And... Uh, as you probably know, uh, his fame, as far as the public goes, uh, was nothing to do with his book on the chemical bond, on, on almost beating uh, Watson and Crick to the structure of DNA. His fame was from vitamin C curing the common cold. And that was really quite incredible because here was a guy who had published hundreds of peer-reviewed papers. I mean, you know, he's the only one in history to ever win two unshared Nobel Prizes, one in chemistry and one in, in peace. He was quite a guy. And then he comes out with this little booklet about vitamin C curing the common cold. No studies, no evidence, except anecdote, you know, himself and his wife and whatever. But this was Linus Pauling. So the world took it as, you know, proof. Everyone was guzzling vitamin C. And then studies started to be done, mostly with marine recruits. They're ideal for, for this because 
if you tell a marine recruit to jump, the only thing he asks is how high. So, you know, if you tell them to take vitamin C, such a dose, they, they will do it. So the studies were done, and, and it didn't prevent the common cold. But then another study was done, which showed that if you take vitamin C, I hesitate to say this, because mostly anecdote, but anyway, a gram of vitamin C an hour for four hours, when you feel a cold coming on, you feel the scratchiness on the back of the throat, yeah, yeah. that you can stop the cold from blossoming. I think it works. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I, like, I, I like the uncertainty in that yeah, answer. It, it is uncertain. It is absolutely anecdotal evidence, but someone should do a proper study on, on that one. But one more question before we get into uh, another display. But you're talking about snake oilsmen. We've all heard of snake oil salesmen. They, they go back a long way. I found your, but I didn't know what they were until I read your book. You maybe, maybe share a bit of history. Snake oil? Yeah. yeah. What is a snake oil? A snake, snake oil at one time was, was sold as, as a real medicine. We're talking about the so-called patent uh, medicine era, late 1800s, early 1900s, when you could basically sell anything. They claimed that it was patented. It meant nothing. And uh, the idea was that snake oil would be beneficial for arthritis. Why? Because snakes are supple, they curve all over the place. They don't have arthritis, right? <laughs> so if they're well lubricated on the inside, if you could somehow isolate that lubricant, you could use it in people. So snake oil remedies were born. Uh, Mostly they didn't contain any snake oil because snakes don't give up their oil so, so readily. Uh, but instead, they usually contained opium, a good dose of alcohol. And that will make you feel good. Uh, but of course, they didn't cure the underlying disease. And then, of course, when we learned that they didn't really do anything, then snake oil became sort of the catch-all word for ineffective uh, uh, therapies. But there have been you know, a lot of other very interesting questions o over the years. And I, I thought maybe I'd show you some, uh, show them too, so that we can. Uh... Let's see. No, it's, 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 stay here, Josh. You can, you'll, see, you'll see it here. OK, super. Uh, OK, can we get the questions up? There we go. Some, some of the interesting things, you know, that we've had to deal with <laughs> over the years, unusual. How do you open a cremation urn that has been epoxied shut? <laughs> it, 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 it turned out that, that the, uh, uh, the lady uh, uh, whose husband was in the urn uh, wanted to follow the instructions in the will and uh, cast them into the ocean, but couldn't get the urn open. So we had to fool around with it and tried various solvents and eventually it turned out that methylene chloride worked. And methylene chloride is highly toxic, but in this case it didn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> and then, <laughs> how come bicycling under high voltage power lines in lycra shorts causes? Josh, you should know something. <laughs> no. jo that Josh, is, it. Josh is an avid cycler. I keep getting shocks, I never knew why. <laughs> so I don't know, I, 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 I've tried it, I've cycled under the power lines with Lycra shorts, I never felt anything. So I, I don't know. <laughs> then there was a question of is it safe to kiss a dead body? Well, I, you know, that's sort of a gray answer. <laughs> Depends dead from what and how long dead. <laughs> so, I don't know. And then there are all kinds of things. I'm not going to bore you with all of this. I mean, it's everything from can you eat a banana peel to, to uh, can a Pilates ring give you cancer? You know what a Pilates ring is? I mean, it's this gizmo that you play with when you do Pilates. And when you buy it, it comes with a warning. Known to the state of California to cause cancer. Oh, this, this product contains chemicals known to the state of California to cause cancer. You've seen those warnings on many, many products. I mean, this is this ridiculous Proposition 65 in California, uh, which doesn't know the difference between hazard and risk. Uh, and anyway, so you'll see those, those uh, warnings. Someone was worried about black bean soup because it had calcium chloride in it. 
and that's a de-icer. Well, it has calcium chloride because it keeps the beans firm, perfectly fine. And our tiger nuts a superfood. Though that one's timing me for a while. Uh, but it has nothing to do with eviscerating tigers. <laughs> a tiger nuts are the, the, uh, they're a tuber, uh, very much like a potato. And they're, they're sold as a, as a treatment for all kinds of diseases. Uh, I've never found that it works. Anyway, you can see, I mean, there's all kinds of interesting questions that, that come up. And, and, you know, one can go on ad nauseum about, is it safe to eat Cheerios? Why? Because it may contain a couple of parts per billion of glyphosate, which is the world's most widely used uh, uh, wheat killer. Yes, it is safe to eat Cheerios. Uh, I mean, there, there are better cereals than that, you know, but it is safe to eat Cheerios. And, and the, the aluminum wrapping around your chocolate bar is, is not a problem. Your clothes will not get whiter if you add aspirin to your wash. Uh, <laughs> Now, that was an interesting one. Where does hair color go when you bleach your hair, right? <laughs> I mean, it's a reasonable question. You know, you put out these chemicals and, and you wash it out. Did your hair color go down the drain? Well, of course, no. That's a chemical reaction that, uh, you know, changes the color of the hair using dyes. Um, there's no problem with even four uh, tablespoons of uh, uh, you know, of, of adding uh, uh, bicarbonate to your muffins. How do you remove goat smell from a basement? That was, that was in, in, interesting. <laughs> Believe it or not, there was a guy who kept goats in his basement for, for the goat milk, uh, each to his own. And if you've ever smelled a wet goat, you never want to smell that again. <laughs> That's caproic and caprylic acid, which are, are, are terrible. Is it dangerous to write on your hand with a ballpoint pen? Sorry? Nobody has ever done a double blind I just study. Start, I just started taking yeah, notes, yeah, sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> and here I had to make a house call, believe it or not, on a Barbie doll. Why? Because uh, she had a chip on her lipstick, and the little girl who owned the doll used a marker pen to try to fix it. The results were horrific. Uh, it was so bad that, that even Ken could not look at it. <laughs> so I actually had to make a house call with a number of solvents to see if we could get it off. And it wasn't all that successful. So she, uh, I can't show you the results. <laughs> look, I, it's a terrifically entertaining to listen to. And the crowd is in your hand. But do you ever worry that you're speaking to the converted, that, it's a, that, it's there's, a, it's that the people who want to hear it's a constant skeptics worry. come and the people who believe in magic are it's a at constant, a magic show. It's a constant worry because I know that the, a lot of people who listen to us are people who don't need to listen to us. Uh, but, you know, I, I found during the years experience that you can kind of divide the, the general public out there, not you guys, but <laughs> the general public out there into three categories. There are those who are properly educated, who you don't have to worry about because they're mastered critical thinking, they know what to do. There's the other extreme, whose minds are cemented shut. And these are the dedicated anti-vaxxers, the dedicated Trumpists. These are the ones that you're not going to get through to, no matter what. We've tried, it's like banging your head into the wall, or the creationists. And we've, I've stopped arguing uh, with that. But there's a big section of the public who are legitimately confused because there's a lot of confusing information. I mean, one day you're told to stay away from butter because it contains saturated fat. Switch to margarine. Then you're told margarine contains trans fats, which are worse than you know, the, the butter was in the first place. Then you're, you're, you're told to eat fish because it contains omega-3 fats especially when you're pregnant. You're gonna give uh, birth to uh, babies with higher IQs. And then you find out that the fish has PCBs or mercury in there. So, you know, there's a lot of legitimate confusion. I used to really enjoy wine when it was good for you. Right. And it doesn't, <laughs> I, I don't enjoy it as much anymore. Can you, I like it, but still, it was better then. What do True. you think? Listen, listen, alcohol is a known carcinogen. 
There's no question about that. What? You know, uh, alcohol causes cancer of the mouth, uh, cancer of the breast. You know, uh, but then again, it comes down to a risk-benefit analysis. There's some benefit to drinking wine. Many of you will attest to that, <laughs> right? But that benefit is to the palate, not to your heart, not to any other organ. Uh, that really has been ruled out. The stories about resveratrol that you know made the rounds, which is this magical chemical that, that was supposed to, to uh, prevent every known disease. Well, what was left out of that equation was that the studies that showed resveratrol to be effective were done in mice, and that the amounts used were equivalent to what you would find in 100 bottles of red wine. Now, even the most dedicated wine lovers <laughs> will be challenged by 100 bottles a day, right? So again, you know, the numbers matter. Next thing I know, you're going to tell us poutine is bad for us. <laughs> but it tastes good. <laughs> and this, this is also a risk-benefit battle all the time, you know, is that if you like it, you probably shouldn't be eating it, right? <laughs> if you don't like it, well, you can have as much kale as you like. <laughs> Some people actually like kale. My daughter likes kale, and she's a physician, and she yeah. knows. Yeah, but do we like it because we like it? Do we like it because we think we should like it because right. it's good for us? Yeah. No? Yeah. Complicated, well, right? Anyway, I mean, the, the truth is that we know that the closer we are to a plant-based diet, although I don't think it has to be exclusively the better. We've learned that. You know, we have a lot of, of epidemiological evidence now for that. Yeah. Uh, I don't have much else I want to ask you here. Uh, just before we get down to the final act here, I think. Uh, no, I think, listen, I, I, know you, I know that, you know, we talk scientific communication. I think you have, you, one of the older weapons in your arsenal is magic. It and is. I think you have some for us this evening. I do, and it's a story that I like to tell because it is a true story, and you know, we do restrict ourselves to the truth. And it's a story of how I really got started, which takes me back to grade six in Miss Wolofsky's class, who is now Mrs. Frankel and she's still around. And I was invited to a birthday party, and uh, my friend's parents had hired a magician to entertain us. But most of the tricks he did were eminently forgettable. He wasn't good. But there was one trick that was memorable, and it turned out to be life-changing. He showed us three ropes, red, white, blue, tied together with a knot at the top, together with a knot at the bottom. He undid the knot at the top, and he tied together the red rope and the white rope. He did the other one around, turned around, he undid the knot at the other end, and tied together the white rope and the blue rope. And he triumphantly showed us that he had converted three ropes into one. <laughs> but there was no applause forthcoming. So he thought he better do something more. So he said, well, now I'm going to show you the real magic. And he rolled those ropes up in his hand, just like I'm doing now. And he said, you know, I never go anywhere without my magic chemical. And he reached into his pocket to take out his magic chemical, which he sprinkled on the ropes. And believe it or not, the three ropes melded into one. <laughs> well. I knew that it had not been done with any magic chemical. I knew that there was some secret there. And then he went on and he used his magic chemical again. He said, you know, this time I have a flexible rope here and I'm going to make that rope defy gravity. So he took that rope, he reached for his magic chemical, which he sprinkled on the rope. And believe it or not, that rope defied gravity. Now, I knew it wasn't done with any magic chemical. I knew if I tried to do it, this is what would happen. <laughs> but he, with his magic chemical, was able to make that rope defy gravity. 
It's only to ropes I can do that. <laughs> I see. You can always tell the age of the audience <laughs> by that, that reaction. <laughs> anyway, uh, that stimulated me to go to the school library, take out a book on chemistry and magic. And I followed both of those ever since. And you probably think that, you know, there's not much relation between those, right? Chemistry is a hard science, firmly rooted in the laws of nature, right? I mean, uh, magic is the opposite. What does a magician do? Makes the impossible possible, you know, defies gravity. But of course, chemistry can look like magic if you don't know what's going on. You saw it here. Wasn't that magical? Would that color change? But when you find out what is really happening, that it's a starch iodine reaction, then all of it starts to make sense. So that's how I got into, in, into both. Because of course, everything a magician does on stage is done by perfectly explicable means. It's just that the audience is not privy to those means. Whereas in chemistry, we relish in revealing the secret. But magic also works for us in teaching in another way because it can focus attention when you're telling stories. And I'll give you an example of that. You know, one of the uh, greatest discoveries ever made was in 1846 in Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital, when for the first time ether was used as an anesthetic. And uh, the way that the world heard about that, believe it or not, was from a magician, Robert Houdin, who had heard about this story of a patient being put to sleep with ether in Massachusetts General in Boston. And he used that in his magic act. He came out on stage and he told the audience that he had heard about this magical chemical that could put, eth put people to sleep. But he discovered something else, that after they were put to sleep, they could defy gravity and they would rise up into the air. And he actually performed such a levitation of a lady. Do you want to see that? Okay. Well, I generally ask for a volunteer from the audience, but I actually brought my own. Here she is. <laughs> appropriately attired. <laughs> and this is what happened. Houdin would wave some ether under the volunteer's nose until she fell asleep. Would then be placed on a couch, just like that. And then with a cloth, the couch would be covered like that so that she was clearly visible, correct? And then as the music played, in the back, workers would pour some ether onto hot shovels so that the fumes of ether would spread in the theater. And then she would rise up into the air, just like that, and float with no support, and then as the music reached a climax, she would disappear. <laughs> well, that was Robert Houdin, and that is the true story. That's how the world heard about ether. And if they ever had to go to a hospital and undergo anesthesia, they knew that the worst thing that could happen would be that they would float off the operating table. <laughs> but I see that you're not sufficiently amused by that story. <laughs> you would rather see something really fly. All right, let's give this a try. In the late 1800s, that was the heyday of spiritualism when in seances, people would gather around the table, put their hands on the table, the medium would invoke the spirits, and the table would start to move. And believe it or not, it would rise up into the air 
and float just like that. And that was a trick that was performed by mediums to convince people that spirits were real. Believe it, no. <laughs> believe it or not, people believed it. And this was the heyday of spiritualism. Unbelievably, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, the most scientific detective in history, who, whose motto I live by, the motto being that it's a capital mistake to theorize before one has data before, because insensibly one begins to fit the data to the theory instead of the other way around. And Conan Doyle was a believer in spirits. He was a believer in fairies. And yet he created Sherlock Holmes. It's, it's amazing. And Josh, you, you were speaking before when, when you did that, uh, the documentary, um, fraud, fraud, etc. Well, that's something that you know, we've dealt with, uh, with psychic surgery. Uh, psychic surgery is, is when um, an untrained person, usually a Brazilian or a Filipino peasant, claims to be able to remove tumors from the body without ever making an incision. It's incredible. And James Randi uh, demonstrated this very often. And looks very good. I like to demonstrate it too. Uh, Randy would pay, take out a piece of, of chicken liver or, or you know, with some uh, other organ that looked really real. Uh, when I do this in class, of course, I, I don't uh, do that. But I replicate it in this way. See, because you can remove something and I let this be, you know, the tumor that is being removed. And it is all done very simply by sleight of hand. I can even put it back. See, and it's, it's gone. And that's, that's psychic, uh, psychic surgery. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, over the years, we've had a, a lot of fun uh, doing demos. Alex, you can get your cannon ready. I think you have a question, though. I do have. Well, a, we have one last question, which is. Lawrence, we have one last Lawrence, question. Lawrence, we will. We will certainly get to that. Okay. But I, you know, people love to see stuff like this. <laughs> you want to see that again? <laughs> no, I bet you no. do. No. No matter what. No matter what. Whether you're talking to kindergarten kids, you're talking to PhDs. They love to see things burn. <laughs> OK. And disappear. That, of course, looks impressive. But of course, there is an explanation. That is paper that has been treated with nitric acid and sulfuric acid. What we have there is nitrocellulose. So there's a lot of oxygen built into, into it already because of the chemical reaction. That's why it burns so effectively. It's a really neat, neat reaction, right? It's pretty, it's pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, yeah, I know that that's one other thing, but uh, let me show you something else. When we were doing our public lectures, one of them almost came to an unfortunate end because we had this car, which was powered with a fire extinguisher, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we forgot to put a brake. <laughs> And this was in, in Auto Mass 112, which is a lecture room smaller than this. And it smashed into the wall. <laughs> so that was just about the only accident we ever had. But over the years, you know, uh, we had so much fun uh, speaking uh, to uh, members of the House in Washington, uh, speaking to Canadian uh, Senate in, in, in this case. And then uh, I had the chance to teach chemistry to our original astronauts, uh, including Julie Payette. And uh, so that was, that was fun. Uh, meeting Bill Nye, uh, that was fun. 
then uh, going down to uh, uh, the Johnson Space Center and uh, getting royal treatment from the astronauts. That was fun. This was fun. You know, you won't recognize this. This is in Battle Creek, Michigan. This is not an ordinary bathtub. This was John Harvey Kellogg's bathtub. And what you see beside there is an enema machine. <laughs> and that, that would be filled with yogurt. If you've ever seen The Road to Wellville, wonderful movie, Anthony Hopkins starring as John Harvey Kellogg. Have you ever seen that movie? It's a, just a great movie. He, he uh, is with a patient and he diagnoses something and he looks at his attendant and he says, would you please bring in the yogurt? And the patient says, but Dr. Kellogg, Dr. Kellogg, I don't like to eat yogurt. <laughs> and with a twinkle in his eye, he says, oh, you won't be eating it. <laughs> <laughs> So I had the chance to visit that museum there, and even better, uh, to sit in that, uh, in that tub. Uh, and we did that when we did this uh, show on Discovery Channel, Science to Go, we traveled around on the country, and that's where I had the chance to sit in there sans yogurt. But uh, nevertheless, it, it, it was neat. But I think one of my most memorable experiences was this. This is the lecture room in London. And uh, this is the, uh, many of you who are in science will know what this is. This is the Royal Institution, uh, which uh, is an absolute landmark in science. This is where Michael Faraday uh, first started to, to lecture, and he is the granddaddy of the public lecturers. And to be uh, in that lecture room and to give a talk, that, that really was, uh, you know, a highlight. I mean, because that was 200 years ago. Uh, there's Faraday. Prince Albert is in the front row, Queen Victoria's uh, husband. Uh, I told you about 1846 operation about anesthesia. This is a, a photograph uh, or a painting of, of that. And this was in Massachusetts General, in what is known as the Ether Dome. And it was really fun to be able to go and give a talk there. It's still, of course, it doesn't look exactly like it looked uh, uh, then. But that this, you know, is a holy place in the uh, realm of, of, of science. We also had the chance to, to go to uh, Scotland. And many of you who are golfers will recognize that bridge, the most famous in the golf bridge in the world that's at St. Andrew's Golf Course. So, you know, OSS has given us a lot. It's been, it's enabled us to, to travel. Uh, some of you may know this, this giant spoon is in Tel Aviv. It's in front of Uri Geller's museum. Uh, Uri Geller uh, bends spoons, <laughs> bends minds, yeah? And uh, I had the chance to meet him together with my grandkids. And um, he was very jovial. He was very nice. And it just wasn't the opportunity. I, I just couldn't feel to do live debunking there because he was, you know, so nice. And he bent a spoon for me. He autographed it. I still have it. Uh, he told me uh, it's going to be worth a lot more when he dies. Uh, I didn't like that comment because he's exactly my age. <laughs> But, but you know what he did? He actually, he did this for us. Uh, he, he took a spoon. Cannot be bent, correct? But it, not, not easily. Not easily. Well, what Yuri did was took this unbendable spoon, stood in front of us, and bent it. Just like that. <laughs> and the amazing thing was that he restored it after. He's stronger than he looks. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was kind of fun. And uh, this was also fun when Aislinn did this portrait because I am a big <laughs> Canadians fan. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, I mean, Aislinn was very nice, and I, I think he, you know, he had a kick out of doing that uh, as well. But maybe my most uh, sort of interesting uh, memento was this one. 
Some of you will remember Danny Gallivan, who was the best hockey announcer of all time. And he wrote me this note that he would listen to, uh, to the show. And uh, there's Danny uh, doing play-by-play -play. with who? With Dick Irvin, exactly. But I think the ultimate fame was reached when I made it into the National Enquirer. <laughs> And as you can see, I told everyone that people think all chemicals are wolves in sheep's clothing. The truth, he says, is that everything in the world is made of chemicals, and that is very true. <laughs> okay, now, so listen. Hang on. I think we've had the privilege of being with the granddaddy of public science lectures in Montreal for decades here, which is nice. And the evening's about over, but there is, I believe, a long tradition here of a final question. And that final question always goes to the same person, which is Lauren, Tr Lauren Trottier, the founder and philanthropist behind this, and the reason you're all here tonight. So, uh, Lauren Trotty, well, what is the secret last question tonight, please? She got me on the spot here, but anyway, I came up with something. I hope you, you find it okay. Um, you know, you, you have a, a lifelong uh, history here of uh, debunking all kinds of quacks and pseudoscientists, people, and so on and so forth. Uh, can you give us an anecdote of one such incident or encounter that you had that sticks in your mind as being something that was very memorable or very effective, or you really socked it to them, or, or something like that? <laughs> Actually, yeah. <laughs> uh, there was one very interesting story. Uh, there was this healer from New York who would sometimes come to Montreal to heal people just by hovering his hands over, over the person. And he would uh, very often be brought in by Lubavitch organizations. And which that itself is an interesting story. Uh, so he came to, to uh, Montreal once, and uh, I wanted to find out what this really was all about. So I sent uh, Melody, who you saw, who's now a physician, who was then our, our, our intern. And I sent her to go uh, to this guy and say that she had a backache, because so many people have backaches, and it's a common come and, and see what he does. So she came back, and she says to me, I felt it. So I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> you, you felt what? Says, well, he hovered his hands over me, and I felt this static. I felt my skin tingle. So I said, what the hell is going on here, you know? <laughs> So, uh, because she was very reliable, and I believed what she said, so what do I do? I call up James Randi. I say, this is, you know, what was reported. Do you know any way that this can be done? He says, oh, yeah. There's no question. This is, this is a common thing, and I tell you what to buy. And it cost me 300 bucks. But it was a device that you buy in, in, uh, from a magic supplier. It produces static electricity. So you have this pack that you put, uh, you strap it onto, onto your leg, and there's an electrode that goes down to the bottom of, of your shoe. And uh, uh, you just you push a button, and stat static electricity you, it charges your hand with static electricity, and when you hover it over someone, you know, even the hair stand up. I said, I gotta see this. So I go myself. I get an appointment with him, and um, I, I also tell him, you know, backache. And so I lie down on, the, on, on his table, and he starts hovering, and I feel nothing. And then he walks around, disappears for a moment behind me comes on the other side, and then I feel it. All hair stands up. Static electricity, just like, you know, when you put your hands in front of a TV, it, that's exactly what it felt like. So I said, you know, this is neat stuff, you know. So uh, 
I didn't know exactly what to do at that time. I mean, I couldn't tell them, let me see what's under your pants. <laughs> 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 Wouldn't have sounded right. <laughs> uh, but I say, look, you know, uh, we do experiments like this at McGill. And uh, would you be willing to come down and show us and my colleagues exactly this? And he says, yes, of course, I'm willing to show. And then I made a stupid, stupid mistake because I knew how this was done. And he says, well, you want me to do just what we did here? Yes, I said, yes, except we might ask you to take your shoe off. <laughs> that was a dumb thing to say because he knew that I knew. So of course, we never heard from him again, <laughs> but he never came back to Montreal again either. <laughs> so. Anyway, you know that uh, every proper science public lecture should end with a bang. Yes? All right. We're going to make one big bang. We will roll out the cannon. Now, let me introduce you to Alex and his crew. Alex, uh, Alex runs our outreach program. Do I want to be on stage or do I want to run? Uh, I think you're going to sit there. Okay. With me. <laughs> uh, Alex will also have some cards if any of you are interested in having this done in your home <laughs> or elsewhere. Okay. Uh, it will require an explanation. What we have in the what we have in the dewer there is liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen, of course, will very happily expand to a gas. So into the cannon goes water, which will warm up the liquid nitrogen, which is in a bottle. The cannon is now going to be loaded with uh, ping pong balls. <laughs> OK. So we're going to put the uh, liquid nitrogen into the bottle. OK. Cap the bottle. It's being warmed up. Ping pong balls. OK. We wait. <laughs> Big enough bang? Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed the evening. And thank Josh for. Thank you. He will be selling books and magic crystals after the show if you want any. Come on down.